Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, the Grow Groove and Discipleship Director here at FaithBridge, and I'm here with Bible teacher Ben Stewart, who just brought our Easter message, The Song of Easter, a look at Psalm 110, where we looked at um, some passages where we talked about how this psalm was brought into the New Testament as one of the favorite ways that New Testament believers looked at Jesus, sang about Him, remembered Him. Right. Um, it was such an interesting look. We had lots of questions that came in yeah. from this, and beginning sure. with this this uh, priest, Hebrew priest and king that you brought up, right. Melchizedek. Right. I got it, right? That's you did. it? Okay, yeah, good. All right. It. So tell us, you talked about him and Abraham, right. um, and you right. mentioned that it's just kind of a brief mention right there at the beginning with him. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us, this question came in, can you tell us anything more about him? Well, I can. Maybe the best thing to do would be this, you know, you can read and Genesis where he shows up. It's very briefly, it's only one chapter that he shows up, but the writer of Hebrews, he comes up in Hebrews chapter one, six, seven, eight. I mean, the writer of Hebrews goes through a lot about um, why he matters in the conversation. And you know, the book of Hebrews is basically talking about how Jesus is the superior, whatever. He's superior to angels. He's superior to Moses. He's superior to the law. And there was an Old Testament priest system, but Jesus is superior to that, and here's why. And so much of the book of Hebrews is actually an unpacking of Psalm 110. So uh, I would just direct you to the book of Hebrews <laughs> okay. rather than me trying to unpack all of it right in this second yeah, so you can because read it's that. great information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that would be a great place to start. Uh, for sure. Okay, and so you did walk us through and talking through the process of forgiving sins and mm -hmm. how um, Jesus replacing that system right. that we see in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. um, and a question came in around, um, can someone who has committed the ultimate sin be forgiven? Yeah, well, that's tricky because I'm not sure what they mean right. when they say the ultimate mm -hmm. sin. You know, I will say, um, there's only one place in the Bible where you see a, a sin mm -hmm. being called one that will not be forgiven. And it's Mark chapter three, it's Jesus says it's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And you go, what's, he ta what's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Well, if you look at the context, Jesus had been healing people by the power of the Holy Spirit. That was the Holy Spirit empowering the work of Jesus in order to authenticate Jesus really is the son of God. He really is the king. And the religious leadership looked at Jesus and said, we can't deny his power. We're just going to say his power is from Satan. You're from the devil. And Jesus said, there's no forgiveness for that. So what is the unforgivable sin? It's looking at Jesus and saying, you are not the son of God. You are not powered by the spirit of God. You are evil and powered by the devil. So what is the unforgivable sin in the Bible? It's mm -hmm. rejection of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so is there forgiveness for rejecting Jesus Christ? No. Now, can you reject him and then come to believe in him? Yeah, that's happening all through the Bible and all through history. But if you go to your grave with an absolute rejection of Jesus Christ as who he says he is, that is the one thing that's going to get you through the door in the presence of God is belief in him. You reject him, that's not forgiven. So biblically, that's what you see. So I'm not sure what all they, they meant by that, but Mark chapter 3. Well, good. That's yeah, that's a good clarification. Yeah. Okay. And so you did talk about fear, um, mm -hmm. a very relevant topic, obviously, with everything that's going on. You gave very clear examples of things that are, right. make our feel, world feel a little bit out of control sometimes. Um, and this person wrote in and said, um, you talked about um, Christ overcoming our fear and how we don't have to fear in that. Um, and this person says they've surrendered their own trials to God and they have no fear of the enemy. But what they do have fear of is that when the kingdom of heaven comes, that their loved ones won't be there. Mm -hmm. So how do they face the fear that their parents and brothers will not see the salvation because of their rejection of God? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. And you know, the Bible doesn't say you should never be anxious or never be fearful. That's a natural response to disturbing things. It's just, what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. And 
The Bible's real clear on that. First Peter will say, you cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You know, Philippians will say, don't be anxious about anything, but let these requests be made known to God. So I do think it's right to, Paul said, I have unceasing anguish at the thought of the people I love not knowing Christ. So Paul's like, I am dis disturbed by that. It's right to be disturbed by that. But Paul talks about that in the context of Romans, where what does he do? He ultimately trusts in the sovereign guidance of God over history. So ultimately, what does he do? He comes back to the character of God and who God is and says, I rest in that. And so I do think we labor in prayer over our relatives. We're begging God that they would come to know Christ. But at the end of the day, we're saying, I trust you, God, with their story. I trust you with their life. And that's where our fears can find some comfort as we go. The guy running all of this is not chance. It's the king that we know who's strong and who's loving. So I think you, you beg God that, that your family and your friends would come to know and trust Jesus. And then you, and then you trust him in whatever he does. So that's a really short answer to a really deep question, but that's maybe the, the, the simple answer, short answer to it. Good. Okay. So Jesus resurrection. We talked a lot about that today and, um, right. and, and the scriptures, um, give a lot of detail about his life and his crucifixion. Um, this question comes in around, um, the 40 days that happened between the resurrection and the ascension, essentially mm -hmm. the time between when he resurrected and then was taken up and went up to heaven. Um, but it doesn't have a lot of great details about that time. Um, the questions coming around is, um, that's important too. Why, why don't we know as much about that? Yeah, well, um, I don't know that I would say, I'm, I mean, you do get, the, the Bible's very economic with a lot of things, mm -hmm. you know? So you run into people all the time that are like, why isn't there more mm -hmm. in the Bible about dinosaurs? And you <laughs> go, because they're not really the plot line. Mm -hmm. And you look at, you know, Ab Adam, you go, how many kids did he have? Well, read beginning of Genesis, he had at least seven but we don't get the names of most of them, only three, why? Because the Bible's really economic. You don't see what these guys look like, they don't describe Moses' face, all kinds of details. We tell a modern story they don't care about. We're giving you the bare bones story. So when you get to Jesus, a lot of energy is around the fact that he lived a perfect life for us, and then a lot of energy is around his death, that he was a real person who really died, and it was to really take our sin. And then what really matters is the fact that he rose. And the rest of your New Testament is an unpacking of the fact that he rose, the implications of it. So the sightings of Jesus afterwards, are they relevant and important? Absolutely. And you get, I mean, you go, who were the key characters? Mm -hmm. He had women that followed him and you get a couple descriptions of his encounters with them. You get his disciples and you get at least three encounters with them. You get the massive bigger group of hundreds that followed him. You get a presentation of that in Acts. So you go... He had his inner circle of disciples, the outer ring of women, then the 500. You get an intersection with all of them. So you go, I, I don't know that, mm -hmm. that the Bible's right. like, we got it. Like, that's what we need. So I don't know what other story mm -hmm. you want to know mm -hmm. other than he unpacked the implications to them. But if you notice, that's what the rest of your New Testament is. So I guess I, I don't fully grab the question of going like, the, the Bible's going to cut you short on a lot of things, mm -hmm. but it's trying to give you the main narrative. He was a real guy was really perfect, really died, really rose. And that really has implications for the rest of your life. And so there are several post-resurrection accounts, but there's not, according to the Bible, like in a lot of cases, there's as much as you need and not really any more than that. Good. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, That's it's a good. good question, okay, though. so we have one other question that came in around um, uh, really post-resurrection. Um, yeah. This person said um, that they would love to hear more about the significance of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. well, sure, you should. <laughs> we did a whole, uh, I think it was maybe three or four years ago, I did a sermon, an Easter sermon, an Easter sermon. all Actually, about the Holy Spirit. I think it might have been only two years ago. Is that right? Yeah. I, I think so. I've had kids yeah. in the last, I don't I, I know think what's it was. Only a couple Well, then two ago. years ago, yeah. they can look it up because yeah, it's all it about that, mm -hmm. you know, um, much of why Jesus came, why did he die to move sin out of the way, to restore connection with God? How's that connection manifest in us? It's the presence of his Holy Spirit in our lives. That's why, according to, to John, the first thing he did when he saw his disciples again is, is he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That, that's what he came to bring, that intimate, animating presence of God in us. He had to move sin out of the way 
to bring that intimate relationship back. And that's the great gift of the book of Acts is we have the Spirit of God now in us, empowering us to be witnesses of Jesus Christ, empowering us to manifest the fruit of God, joy, peace, and patience, and those things. And uh, so there is much about the, new, the Holy Spirit. Um, we did a sermon on its relevance to Easter two years ago, mm-hmm. maybe rather than giving that whole thing, I would say go yeah, check that I'd out. Say, go check it out. Uh, and check then out about the, the Holy Spirit in general, yeah, we should be talking about Him a lot. And hopefully you'll hear about Him a lot in, in, uh, because the Father, Son, and Spirit uh, all have, have much to offer us. So. Awesome. Well, yeah. always a pleasure to have you back with us. And sure, we have one more week. Yeah, we'll see you back, back here yeah. next week. Awesome. So great. And we'll see you back here next week for Postscript. Keep your questions coming. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.